Hi, I'm Frank, and I am here to talk to you today about lightweight eBPF tracing with Ply. So, long story short, I wrote a book on embedded Linux. This is the book. It's a big book. Uh, my co-author is Chris Simmons, and he will be speaking tomorrow on Android and Yocto, compare and contrast. Please check that out. I currently work for Lunar Energy, which is a startup in Silicon Valley, and they are doing home electrification for a sustainable future. So the agenda for today. First, I'm gonna explain what eBPF is. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the tool, Ply, and why we, uh, you want to use that on an embedded system instead of BPF trace. Then I'm going to show you what Ply can and can't do. Uh, after that, I'll show you how to enable EPPF in a Linux kernel. And then we are going to add BPF to a, a build root image for uh, targeting the BeagleBone Black. And lastly, I'll give you examples of the kinds of scripts that you can write in Ply. So what is eBPF? eBPF is a kernel feature. It was introduced in Linux 3.18, uh, but it wasn't really usable until about Linux 4.4. And if you want to use it now with uh, user space tools that require it, I recommend using at least a kernel of 4.9 or later. Uh, eBPF is a virtual machine running inside the kernel. It is a sandboxed environment, so it runs um, it, it, it runs bytecode it, it, uh, that is JIT compiled into native code inside the kernel. Uh, it provides an event-driven runtime, so it, uh, this is, it's in, interrupt-driven. Uh, code executes when uh, servicing an interrupt in the kernel. It is low overhead. And because it is extremely low overhead, uh, it, you can use it in production. And we'll see that a number of major players in tech are in fact using eBPF in production for observability, networking, and security. How does eBPF work? So, you take an eBPF program, in our case, it is written in Ply. Uh, a process, uh, in our case, that, that, that process is the Ply tool, takes the eBPF program, compiles it into bytecode, and sends that bytecode in, into the kernel using a BPF system call. Inside the kernel, the, the BPF bytecode is verified, and if approved, it is then JIT compiled into native code for the CPU architecture. And that program will then run, uh, it, it is, that program is attached to probe points in the kernel and will then run whenever you hit those probe points. So in this case, it's attached to the send message and receive message system calls. So whenever one of those uh, functions executes, the EBF, eBPF program will run. Who uses eBPF? Netflix uses it extensively for observability across their various microservices. Facebook uses it for load balancing and um, uh, to thwart DDoS attacks. So one of the things, uh, so BPF stands for Berkeley Package Filter. So they use it precisely for that, 
filtering packets. They need to drop packets very quickly so that the system isn't overwhelmed. Uh, Google uses eBPF for Google Kubernetes engine, uh, their, their version two of, of the data plane for that product. And AWS uses it for Bottle Rocket. Bottle Rocket is a vir uh, micro virtual machine monitor. Um, and it, it's uh, uh, intended for serverless and container workloads. Microsoft is porting eBPF to Windows. So it will no longer just be a Linux feature. Um, it'll, it'll, it's on its way to Windows. And New Relic uh, acquired Pixie Labs, which was a, um, an eBPF-based startup. And they ha this was in late 2020. And they have since uh, open sourced the, the Pixie Labs code base. And you can use uh, Pixie Lab projects. Um, and in fact, uh, people like AWS are using Pixie Lab code. Here are the leading eBPF projects. There is the compiler toolkit and library, BCC. Uh, there is the there is BPF trace, which is a high level tracing language similar to the one we are going to look at closely today. Catron, which is Facebook's high performance load balancer. Cilium, which is another Silicon Valley startup. Uh, they, they're the biggest proponent of eBPF right now, and their technology is being used in Google Kubernetes engine for V2 of the control plane. And lastly, there is Falco, which is an, an open source uh, security monitoring tool, also targeting Kubernetes. So since BPF trace is out there, it's being used in the cloud, why do we not use BPF trace and embedded? Here are the reasons. BPF trace depends on LLVM at runtime for compilation. Um, so, so if you've ever had to build LLVM, uh, you, you know that it's a mountain of C++ code and it takes a long time to compile uh, for embedded tar targets. Uh, BPF trace depends on the BCC tool chain at runtime. Um, so, and, be, and because that tool chain also depends on LLVM, even if you were able to remove the LLVM dependency from BPF trace, you would still get stuck with it because D BCC also depends on it. Uh, but now the main reason we can't use BPF trace for embedded is because the BBC tool chain only runs on select 64-bit architectures. Uh, so the, 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 the ones that are most known are x86-64 and ARM-64. Uh, not as common in embedded. And BCC requires, requires the kernel sources at runtime. So if, and you don't know which parts of the kernel source it requires, which means you usually end up deploying all of the kernel source and you end up with a, a, an embedded image uh, pushing two gigabytes, which is not what you want. So why Ply? Ply has minimal dependencies, only libc at runtime. Uh, it can target 32-bit ARM and PowerPC, which, which are used in embedded products. Uh, it's, and it, because it's written in C, not C++, it's easier to port the more architectures besides those two. And, uh, it's, it is included in build root as of the, the February LTS release this year. Uh, so you, so adding it is 
trivial. Um, and its syntax is very similar to BPF trace, as we'll see. So I'm going to talk about uh, two kinds of instrumentation uh, you can do with, with Ply. Uh, dynamic instrumentation, and this is what dtrace does. So if, if, if you know, you've ever heard um, you know, Solaris gurus brag about the, the incredible things they can do with dtrace, now we can do them with uh, eBPF and Ply. Uh, so the way dyna dynamic instrumentation works, you're, the, we're inserting breakpoints at instruction addresses. And um, so that when you hit these breakpoints, the BPF program is then triggered, uh, information is recorded, and then, we uh, then after the program completes, execution continues within the kernel. The problem with this kind of instrumentation, it's susceptible to interface instability. So the, the, na the names of functions inside the kernel uh, can change without notice. And also uh, I've discovered that the, the, the names are also in some cases architecture specific as we'll see. So you, you don't always know what the name of a system call is unless you go digging for it. Uh, the, other, the other problem dynamic tracing is susceptible is, is inlining. So the compiler could just inline your kernel function away, optimize it away. And in which case there, there's, then there's no way to attach to it because it, it doesn't exist. The other kind of instrumentation is static. So this, this is stable event names hard-coded into the source code, uh, which maintainers have to, have to, uh, have to enforce. So it's, it's a contract. Uh, you know, I, you are not going to break this API. These, the, the names of these events are, will stay forever. What can Ply do? It can do, uh, it, it can instrument the entry into kernel functions. So here I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm going to be probing the uh, uh, open syscall. It's got the weird name, as you can see. I, I, can't, uh, I, I can't successfully attach to the, the name you would expect. Um, I can instrument exit out of a kernel function. That's what kret probe does. And then I can also do static trace points. So in this case, we, we're attaching to sked wake, wake up, which is a name that doesn't change. What, what can Ply not do? It can't do user space. So you, you can't attach to functions in user space, uh, either at entry or exit. So in this case, we're, you, we're trying to uh, probe uh, the, a read line function in bash. Uh, th these examples are from BPF trace, which can do this. Uh, it, you, you can't do it in ply. And the same goes for static trace points in user space. So here we, we're trying to instrument uh, query start in MySQL. Uh, you can do it in BPF trace, you can't do it in ply. So um, what I'm gonna do now is gonna sh I'm gonna show you how you can enable eBPF in the kernel and uh, um, and I'm also going to show you how you can add the ply package to a root file system image. And the, the, this kernel and root file system are intended for the BeagleBone Black. Um, there's a GitHub repository uh, out there. 
So everything I'm going to show you, I've already done. If you don't want to do it, you can just clone my repo, uh, do, do these four steps, and you will end up with a micro SD card image that you can then boot on the BeagleBone Black um, and run the examples I'm going to show you later on. Uh, you, you simply log in as root, and the password is T. E-M-P-P-W-D. There's an SSH server uh, on it. So you, once you know the IP address of the device, you can simply SSH in. So how, do we, how did I go about enabling eBPF in this kernel? Uh, I started with the August release of build root. And the reason I did that was because uh, the maintainers of the BeagleBone def config had moved to a 5.10 kernel. Previously, the, the BeagleBone def config was at a 4.19 kernel, um, which is a bit long in the tooth at this point. So to configure this kernel, enable the, BP, the, the kernel features needed for eBPF, we do make Linux menu config. And at a minimum, we need, the, we need to select the BPF option, the, the BPF system call that I showed you earlier um, for BCC, which technically we don't necessarily need for ply, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, I've, I've enabled the, the class BPF and action, uh, net action BPF modules, as well as the, the JIT compilation for BPF. From Linux 4.7 onward, you also need uh, these other two options. Uh, Ply requires even more kernel support. So not only do we need eBPF, we need K probes, we need trace points, we need F trace, we need dynamic F trace, and this is the killer here. You need uh, K probe events on no trace. Otherwise, you will get uh, these errors that say, could not probe no trace function. Um, because they are no trace. So you want to be able to probe those. You, you need uh, to enable this, this, cur this, op this option, which requires that all the preceding F-trace stuff be enabled in order to make it available. Uh, adding ply to the build root image is a piece of cake. It's, it's already in the release. You simply go into menu config for the root file system, drill down into target packages, go into debugging, profiling, and benchmark. There's the ply package. Select it, save the def config, and the last line will be added to your def config for the image. Target architectures, they're the, the usual 64-bit and the 32-bit ARM and PowerPC that we need for embedded targets. What does Ply need to build and run? So it needs dynamic library support. Uh, it, sorry, it needs a tool chain with dynamic library support. It needs a cross tool chain with kernel headers that are greater than 414. Uh, I've found that the easiest way to get a tool chain with these things is to simply have build root build the tool chain for you. Uh, it's, it's simpler than uh, using a pre-built tool chain from Lenaro or ARM. Uh, we, we've seen that uh, what features we need enabled in the, in the kernel to use eBPF. Uh, on your build machine, you will need Flex and Bison in order to build to cross-compile Ply. And 
once you've got it on your target, you will need to either log in as root or, uh, or use the Capsys admin uh, capability. Uh, I find it's just easier to log in as root since you're, we're not doing this in production. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to run your ply scripts. Uh, and lastly, you need a debug file system mounted at syskernel debug for ply to work. Here are ply's command line options. The most interesting one is dash capital S, which will show you the BPF bytecode instructions. Um, pretty cool. And the, the other useful option is the, is the dash C command, which will run a, a command in the shell. And when that, uh, when that command exits out of the shell, it will kill the ply trace session for you. So you don't have to. Here's an example of a, one, of a, of a ply one-liner that uses that dash C option. So in this case, I'm running the, uh, the DD command. Um, I'm writing 100 blocks from dev0 to dev null. And then I'm executing the, fo the, the following uh, ply one liner, which is going to probe all the VFS um, kernel calls. So the, the star is a wild card and is going to count the number of calls to, to VFS, VFS functions and sh display them to you by uh, ex executable and function called. The second one-liner uh, uh, again uses a wildcard pattern. Uh, the K is, is shorthand for K probe, so you, so you don't have to write K probe out. And uh, this time you're looking at all the system calls. Uh, in, uh, so everything with that, that leading prefix. I, I know it's a, it's a weird name that, uh, that goes back to the, uh, the, uh, stabili the name stability uh, issues that I uh, talked about. And so this will count all the sys calls and display them to you uh, their counts by caller. So here's that, that uh, dash C one-liner that called DD. So you, there you can see the DD command ran, a uh, hundred blocks were read, and then a hundred blocks were, were written out. Um, it, it automatically deactivated the ply session, and here is the output. From, from ply. You can see that in the first column, the executable name, uh, there's dd, there's drop bear, there's ply, um, and uh, uh, you, you can see for VFS reads and VFS writes at the bottom, we have counts of 101 and 108, which uh, correspond to the uh, 100 blocks that we were dd. Now, the, here's the second, the result of the second one-liner. Uh, we we're counting syscall sys, sys system-wide by function. Uh, you can see that uh, get time of day is being called uh, a heck of a lot, uh, 1,431 times. Uh, same with get time, 486 calls. Um, so something on our system really wants to know what time it is. Now let's look at Ply syntax. Ply syntax is very, uh, I'm told, is very much like aux. So uh, a Ply program consists of m multiple probes. Here is an example of a single probe. So it starts with a provider. Uh, K probe, K rep probe, trace point, colon, and then the probe points. So the, those are the, the, the function names, the, the, the patterns that we want to match the function names. Uh, there's an optional predicate 
I won't go into that. And within the curly braces is the actual program that, that gets executed. And uh, again, uh, many EPF programs will have multiple probes. Um, so uh, you, you saw that the, the first thing in, in the far left was a provider. These are the these are the providers. We have K probe for uh, which would to match entry into kernel functions. K ret probe to match exit out of kernel functions. Um, again, this is dynamic instrumentation, and we have tr the trace point provider. So, so these are key words. Um, so. Uh, and so trace point are those static trace points we, we looked at earlier. And um, in order to find out what the, the names of the kernel functions are, you can cat this call sims file in, in the proc file system. And likewise, for the trace points, you can list this, uh, the, the contents of this events directory, which will give you uh, different subdirectories for the various subsystems in the kernel. And so when you look into one of those directories, you will see the, the, the different events for those subsystems. And you can, also, you can all use, also use perf to get these names. If you do perf list, you can, um, you can then give it some, some patterns to search for. Uh, Built-ins. This is where the magic happens. So these are um, global variables, uh, functions that are automatically available within your ply program. Um, so com is the, the name of the running processes executable. PID is the kernel thread group ID. So if it's a single threaded process, the, the PID is going to be the same as the K PID. Uh, if it's a multi-threaded process, there, there will be multiple K PIDs for, for one thread group. Uh, time is, is a timestamp. So not, not nanoseconds since the system booted. Very useful if you're, if you're trying to profile. Um, and uh, printf is, is the, the, that, the function we know and love. So if you want to do printf debugging of kernel functions, knock yourself out. It, 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 it just works. It's, and uh, um, if you don't know the type of, of the arguments, the function arguments that you're trying to print out, you can just use percent %v in the format string. And it, it, will, it will infer the type, just like print would, would do if you were using print instead of printf. Here are other handy variables. Now, these are provider specific, so they're not available in every context. You can get the stack trace, the, the kernel stack trace. You can't get uh, a, a user stack trace. Uh, in a string format, and you can just print that out if you want to know uh, where you are uh, when you hit a, uh, a, a probe point. Uh, so this only works for uh, K probes and K rep probes, so entry and exit. Uh, on entry, you can also get the, the name of the function uh, that, that triggered the probe. Uh, using the caller variable and the arguments passed into the function uh, using arg0, arg1, arg etc. Uh, Kret probe, which fires on exit, uh, will, uh, you, there is a retval uh, variable which will give you the return value out of the probed function. Ply, you, the, the basic data structure in Ply is a map. Uh, and and uh, so keys, uh, 
key value. And uh, it, ma maps, they take the form of a name and then an expre uh, 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 what could be multiple expressions within the square brackets. And those expressions are separated by commas. And what's in, within the square brackets is the key into the map. Um, so here's an example of assigning into a map. Uh, I'm calling this map Rx. Uh, I, I have this magic arg0 variable uh, already available to me in the context. Whatever it v evaluates to is going to be the key into this map. And then I'm going to assign a, a timestamp in, into this map so that I can then retrieve that timestamp later. Uh, similarly, if you just want to get the value out of the map, uh, you, you can do it uh, like, like this. So we, we have a map called Rx. We, uh, we want to fetch uh, uh, whatever the value that arg0 uh, is, uh, use that as our key. So that will get us the, the previous timestamp. And uh, by subtracting that previous timestamp by the current timestamp, you are able to know how the time elapsed between kernel probes. Aggregations are a special kind of map. Um, they start with an ampersand. Uh, you don't need the name. The, the name is optional. Uh, and uh, the, the, the expressions within the square brackets uh, act as keys, just like with a regular map. Um, what you use aggregations for is to capture the result of an aggregation function. So we've already seen the count function. We, we, we use that to, to count uh, various calls to different functions. And that just bumps a counter. Uh, uh, another aggregation function is quantize. And that will give you the um, the distribution of of the of the the map uh, values, and we'll see what that looks like in right here. So here's a here's a one liner. We are attaching to the exit point of system read, and we are we are we're calling this distribution size. And we are calling the quantize function on the return value from the read, which is the size of the read, as, as we know. Um, so uh, we uh, apply functions like they, 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 they run until you uh, kill them. So when I call apply, uh, uh, I, I actually I have to hit control C after a while in order to force it to exit. When, once I do that, then it dumps out its output. And this is the output that, that you see on the terminal. Uh, what we have here is uh, two calls uh, within a, a, to, to, to read within a range of eight to 15 bytes, one call between a range of 16 to 31 bytes. And then we can see that the vast majority of the calls to read were between 128 and 255 bytes in size. Uh, another handy ply script is OpenSnoop. So uh, OpenSnoop will show you uh, the the pit the process IDs and executable executable names and the the path to the file that that those that those processes were trying to open as they open it uh, as well as the the return code 
So that's what we're, we're printing out here at, in the, in the re return probe, uh, printf debugging. So this is what the, the output from OpenSnoop reveals when, when running on our, our BeagleBone black target. We can see that uh, there is a, there, there's a Redis server process, uh, PID 284, and it is trying to open these files repeatedly, uh, very quickly. I only ran this script for a, a second or two. And, and uh, one of those files is the local time. So it, for, for some reason, Redis really wants to know the time. And because the return code is, is, uh, is negative, it, it looks like something is, is going wrong with, with the open, which is probably why it keeps repeating itself. Similarly, uh, there is exec snoop, which looks for short-lived processes. So if you've, if you've ever tried to debug a, a system in production, um, you, you'll, you'll run into the situation where there is a service that is in, in a crash loop and is just, uh, you know, uh, is just spawning processes and and um, and eating up resources on your system. So so exec snoop will uh, will uh, what it, what it does is it, it it you're instrumenting the call to exec ve. You're capturing the argument passed into it, and you're storing uh, you're, you're storing that argument. So that argument is the executable name. You're storing it by kernel PID into the map. And then uh, upon exit, you, were, you are going to print out the user ID, the, 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 the path to the executable, and the return value uh, of, of the execution. So th this is what this looks like. I, I start exec snoop. In the background, I go and I st stop Redis by calling its, uh, uh, its init script. And then immediately, uh, what, what you see is the output from exec snoop. So it's showing a, a user ID of zero within the parentheses because, uh, because root is what ran uh, that that in its script uh, and uh, and it's ec and an exit code of zero um, and and so it's it's stopping Redis and in order to stop Redis that shell script calls Redis CLI which again triggers exec snoop um, and so we, we we see the 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 call to Redis CLI to stop Redis. Uh, the OK is just is is the output from from stopping Redis. Uh, uh, some time goes by. I start Redis back up using the same init script. Uh, we we see the the init script e execute again. Uh, this time, instead of uh, calling the Redis CLI. It, it actually calls start stop daemon um, to, to, um, to start the Redis daemon. And then, and then we see the, the Redis server itself uh, start up. Uh, and it has a user ID of 1002. So it, it doesn't run as root, it, it runs as a different user. And, and so that start uh, also had a return code of zero. Um, I'll skip this slide. Uh, this is a, a, a ply script that looks at TCP send message and TCP receive message calls. Uh, it counts them. It shows you who, what executable made the calls and uh, what direction um, the, the, their, the, the packet is going. 
Uh, so that's that's the the send and receive that 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 will show up in the output. We're 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 just uh, it's it's part of the key into the aggregation. So again, run our script in the foreground. This time I I call Redis CLI to do a, a, a latency test, and what what that does is it just starts pinging the Redis server. Uh, I, I let that run for a few seconds. Eventually, uh, it, it pings it a, a thousand and twenty-five times. Um, I, I, I kill that. I bring the the ply program back into the foreground, and then I kill that. And now I can see um, that a Redis server had a, a thousand and twenty-five sends. Uh, uh, 1,026 receives, and, and likewise, Redis CLI has, has the same number because it's just pinging uh, uh, Redis server over localhost. Um, you can see that DropBear, which is my uh, SSH server, has a, has a, a lot of sends, 1,041. So I'm, I'm SSH'd into this this uh, machine. Uh, so because I'm SSH'd, it's sending packets. If, if you look at the, the, the call that I made to Redis CLI, you'll see that there's 1,025 samples. Those samples had to count up from zero. So that was a, a, a send over the, the SSH connection. That's where, where, where those sends are coming from. And here's my favorite. Uh, heap all allocations. So this is heap allocation size uh, distribution. So in this case, we are instrumenting entry into the, the BRK system call. What BRK does is it takes a, 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 an address in memory, and this, this address is the new end of the data segment of a process. Um, so so the, 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 this is the, you could think of it as the, the heap. It's, it's like the, 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 the top of the heap. Um, so by looking at that address and comparing it to the previous end, you, you're able to tell how much the heap is growing uh, uh, at each uh, call to BRK. And so it, in order to show a distribution, uh, I, I use the, the quantize function. Uh, in, in this case, I'm taking the, the new end and I'm subtracting the, the, the previous end, and, and that is, the, that is the, the value I'm quantizing on. So uh, once I've done that, I save it into the map. Uh, as as allocation size, and then I need to update the the end of the data segment for that executable in KPID with with arg zero, so that I'd, I uh, so that my next comparison starts at uh, 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 from from the new end. Uh, so here here's an example of this in use. I flush everything out of the Redis server, I start the, the heap allocation ply script uh, in the background. Then I run uh, an LRU simulation using 100,000 keys. And uh, so this is, it, it's, it's going to insert and look up uh, uh, values in, in the cache. And here you can see the hits and misses. As you can see, the, the, it, the, the misses go down as, as the cache becomes uh, more and more populated. Um, so I stop that simulation. I kill the, 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 the ply script. And here is the distribution of heap allocations. Uh, the vast, the, the majority are between 4K and 8K. 
there's a, a, a good number between 18 and 16K, and there's a few larger allocations within 16 and 32K for that, um, that simulation session. All right, um, so I, I mentioned the book. Uh, I, I didn't show the book. The, uh, the, uh, so the, this is the book. I have uh, uh, six copies here with me, and I'm, I'm happy to, to give them out uh, to, to anybody who wants one. Um, oh, and if, if how, how are we doing on time? Do we have time for questions? Okay, yeah, if, if, uh, if anyone would like to ask any questions. Yeah, yeah, print. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I used it in, in those different examples. Um, I, I call print, printf. So that printf is, is running in the kernel probe. So what, so that's what, when you see the output from, from those ply scripts that, that I showed you, uh, a, a lot of times that output is, is from the printf call. So you know, you, you like when you see the uh, the executable name and and the the PID and and the return value, th those are all wrapped in a printf, and and it's the uh, the arg zero, arg one, you know, et cetera. Th those are those are what are getting print at, printed out to the. Yeah. Yes. It 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 it's sa it's saving it into the map. So, the, so the, that's what those those maps do. Is is it's 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 saving those values into the map so that you can you can fetch them later and and update them later. So, yeah, yeah, it, it it's it's in nanoseconds, and and so so keep in mind all this is running inside the kernel. So, so it's eBPF is is a VM inside the kernel, and it's JIT compiled. So, so it's compiled into native code, you know, ARM ARM v7 instructions. So, so it's going to be fast, and and um, you know, and 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 you know, it's it's also it's like an interrupt, you know. So it's like, like that's when it's get that's how it's being serviced. That's how the code is being triggered. Okay. No, no problem. Yeah. Uh, you, you, well, okay, so th there is a bug here, so uh, I'm glad you caught it. Um, yeah, so when you go to heaps com pid, like that, the first time you call this, like, that's not there, right? <laughs> like, you, you, did, you didn't define it, so um, it, I think it's either going to be nil or it's going to be garbage. So, so... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I um I wouldn't count on it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, good good catch. No, only kernel. Uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question for for those listening online. So, uh, ply cannot do. Uh, the, the question was, can ply do uh, user user space tracing? The answer, as far as I know, is is no. And the second question is, 
can it be added uh, given that Ply does not have uh, LLVM or, or BCC uh, as a dependency? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. My, my guess is that, that, that it's, there must be some challenges, otherwise they would have already tried to do it. Um, so we're, oh, it's 5.50, so we're uh, right, right on time. Um, and any more questions? If not, I'm, I'm actually going to go on to uh, uh, Twitter to see if, uh, I mean, not sorry, not Twitter, uh, Slack to see if anybody has questions on Slack. <laughs> do, 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 doesn't look like it, so no. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. So let me uh, get your books. Uh, if I, I can sign them and uh, uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>